right, and now we have uh, uh, about 40 minutes, I think, for uh, general discussion. Uh, and I'm, uh, we'll pass the microphone around uh, so that everything is audible to everyone. And uh, first, maybe specific uh, questions for Jean-Pierre. Yes. Just a very specific factual question. Um, is it the case that you get uh, less pleiotropy, less polygenic inheritance in, for example, yeast and worms that, and insects than you do in, in say, mammals? Less, uh, less Ple pleiotropy. Uh, pleiotropy, which means that a single gene is acting on several functions? Yes. Uh, and, of course, the, the converse, which is uh, um, many, of ma many genes, one function. Many of the so-called um, brain genes are highly pleiotropic, that's for sure. And, uh, and um, uh, that's the reason why uh, we, we favor the idea of, uh, of, these, um, of these assemblies of, uh, of genes. Mm. Uh, because um, uh, the same genes, of course, are used uh, in different, yeah. uh, no. mm. different so patterns of gene expression. My, my question then is, and you may have... L lower down the evolutionary sequence, you may have is it less the case that... Sorry, sorry, is it more the case that lower down in the evolutionary sequence it makes sense to talk of the effect of single genes? You, of you course, I think in the, in the yeast is very... The relation... I am not going to, uh, to, uh, to challenge the idea that uh, one gene, one enzyme in the, in the case of yeast is right. right. Is this still the case? Right. But you know, one gene, one enzyme, when you apply it to the uh, mTOR pathway, which is involved in, uh, um, in the synapse elimination of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the developing uh, networks in uh, autistic children, uh, is not only having this effect on the brain, mm -hmm. but also everywhere, of course. But and between so yeast... So there are necessarily... Uh, and between effects. yeast and, say, humans, yes. you know, there's, uh, there's a continuum of uh but well the between the yeast and the and the uh, high organisms you have first the multicellular stage and then in the multicellular stage you have uh, the stage where the brain is developing and then uh, from the developing brain the human brain and uh, uh, so you, right, are, so you are using nearly the you know the interesting thing is that and this is a result that we have very recently on the uh, on some um, on the nicotinic receptor in the brain just to perhaps mm -hmm. follow your question. Um, when uh, we look at bacteria, uh, very surprisingly, we have uh, discovered, uh, this was shown initially by analyzing sequences, that there are genes in bacteria which code for receptors which are almost identical to our brain receptors. Mm -hmm. So it means that there have been an accumulation of discoveries, if I may say, from bacteria, yeast, and so on, which have been done uh, in the course of evolution, which has been stored in the genome and that we are using now. Did you realize that you have in your brain some molecules which are two billion years old? Sure, <laughs> so uh, to answer your question, which I'm sorry to not to be too long, but it's clear uh, that uh, pleiotropy increased as a function of the increase of complexity of the ah. organism. That's it. That's the short answer. Questions or yes, actually, and maybe if uh, you could uh, say your name uh, for the record. Hi, I'm Tecumseh Fitch, and I had a question about how we can identify the genes that are involved in brain in the changes in brains in humans, based on a kind of paradox, which is that when we look at the signatures of selection that we can do now by taking populations, sequencing them, and looking and basically rebuilding common ancestors. We find signatures of selection in human beings for things like lactose tolerance or for skin color. But when we look at all of these genes that we know very well are expressed in the brain and seem to play an important role, things like ASPM and microcephalin, we don't find strong evidence of selection. And there's nothing... How do you mean strong evidence of selection? How can you say that? We, well, we look at what, we, we take a model of random drift, so what would happen if, the oh, if yeah. there wasn't selection, and then we compare the actual observed no, uh, the present, alleles with those. In the present populations? Well, no, these are, these, this is selection that goes back 100,000, yeah, 500,000 years. Because some of the patterns have been selected before. Well, right, but so that's, that's what I'm specifically what asking uh, about human that's beings. Uh, that's uh, just uh, what I said. So in the human 
being, you have to find what is really new with humans, and there are very few things. That's exactly the point. And uh, the question you ask is how to identify them. Um, it's, of course, to know the human genome. We know it. Nothing has happened the day it was discovered, as you know. Uh, we only know that uh, they are the same number of genes. We know that there is some slight breed for some genes and so on and so forth. And I think and that's the model that we have been building with uh, Igor Sigelny, that we have to relate the ex patterns of expression of these genes during development. That's, that's exactly the way to relate how to understand the development of the human brain complexity with the, with the genome. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Oh, I should not say that. But <laughs> no, but um, uh, I think that's the, the thing to do. And uh, this is ongoing, uh, so some kind of, uh, if I may say, there are more and more gene expression data which are being published about the human brain as a function of development. And precisely, and since these patterns of genes are so complex, they need to be analyzed by, uh, by some kind of uh, uh, computer science uh, scheme, which is what we are trying to do. And of course, uh, we are doing it grossly at the level of the cortex, but uh, now it has also to be done at the level of these, uh, uh, of these cortical areas, uh, which have been presented by Stanislas, and so on and so forth. This is the thing which should be done. Now it's, uh, of course, a very difficult thing to do in vivo because, uh, of course, uh, with a monkey you can take samples, but with a human being, I don't think it's uh, feasible. So, but that's where, uh, to my opinion, the solution is. But maybe there are alternative ones. I'm David Popple. I have a factual question for you and then non-factual questions for Stan. <laughs> the, the factual questions uh, straightforward is um, when we hear about synaptic elimination yes. or pruning or selective stabilization yes. postnatally, the examples are always from primary visual cortex or primary motor cortex. Are there any data from non-primary sensory motor areas to, uh, and do they show the same patterns in fact? Of course. Of, of well, I, 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 don't, I don't see why they should not, but, um, well, but I do think they? I mean, are there? No, I don't, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I have to look for that, uh, but uh, uh, let me think about that. Um, actual facts you want. I have not followed the literature about this. But uh, to well, my. Well, I mean, you can give a non factual answer just like <laughs> st Stanley. But, <laughs> but the, I mean, I, I, it would just be interesting to know if, for instance, some of the areas that you mentioned in the end, let's say the ones supporting the global workspace hypothesis, show the same yes. kind of postnatal trajectory and development that primary visual areas show. And I, guess I, I just, maybe it's no, true, maybe it's not. You know, the, 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 let's me, let me answer to your question. Because um, if you look at uh, the development of long range connectivity, in the case of uh, the children that I showed, where there was a, a loss of uh, a, an older loss, it does not deal specifically with the visual cortex. Does not. So the answer is yes, there are some evidence. So uh, uh, no, but uh, I agree with you that I should find more, and this is a, a, a search that I am going to do immediately to satisfy, to please you. Actually, an another Jean-Pierre. Joie uh, published some very nice uh, figures of the trajectory of synaptic uh, elimination in uh, different areas of the cortex, including the prefrontal cortex. And what's interesting is they're much later. In terms of the whole curve is shifted later. And uh, this can be begin to be picked with imaging as the thickness of cortex. And the thickness of cortex is an interesting trajectory. It becomes thicker in children, and then it becomes thinner again. So we, again, this can be measured okay, uh, at I the whole brain level. I forgot this uh, uh, very important because <laughs> Jean-Pierre Bourgeois was one of my <laughs> students, so <laughs> I should have. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's uh, the global, it's uh, the total number of synapses. You know, it's not really, um, I'm what I am looking for is for a specific function. So, uh, so I think at least the argument that uh, Thais has gave is valid for the, Let's put it this way, that the theory is valid for the whole cortex. So if I can harass Stan a little bit, the promise was of a neural code, but the neural 
to search for the neural code, but, but a neural code was not delivered, right? I mean, so the, the very interesting data, I mean, actually the fascinating data on the constituent building ends up being a great correlational story. That is, you, you identify a bunch of areas that seem to have a systematic relationship to the change in constituent size, number, structure. Can you speculate a little bit about what you think a neural code actually would perhaps look like, which is what you're actually searching for, but you sort of left us uh, yearning for? Well, I wish I had the answer. Uh, first, it's not just correlational. No, I, I mean, there's a lot of lesion evidence, and now it's becoming more and more precise, actually. And I, I am particularly impressed by the work of Laurie Tyler, who's showing that lesions to this core network the one that we find in Jabberwocky in the cortex, but also the lesions to their connections, and actually there are two fasciculi, as you know, the, the arcuate and the uncinate, and lesion to either of these will create syntactic deficit. So there's a sort of circuit there, and it's causally related. Now, what is the code? We don't know. I, I, I have been reading the work of Paul Smolensky, and I, I think it's the only proposal around at the moment that there might be a sort of uh, binding by neurons that create a product, a tensor product, of a, a vector that's coding for the role and a vector that's coding for the content assigned to a particular role. I think you know that model. So uh, what's interesting about this model is that, okay, you create these products of neural vectors and the outcome is the merge result and then you can stack these merges in the same circuit and if you assume that one at least one of the codes either the role or the meaning code is sparse so that there is a small number of neurons maybe five or ten percent of neurons that contribute to it so it's it's a sparse code then the superposition will have more and more neurons firing and that would be very much what we are seeing in fMRI, although we're quite indirect in seeing it. So uh, in that respect, I think the Smolensky proposal has something to it. Now, the problem with the Smolensky proposal is that the number of neurons you need keeps growing and growing as you go to more and more merges. So that's not possible. We have to keep it inside the system. And that I don't think there is any solution at the moment, basically. Stanislas comes, he should come here. Yes, it would be easier. Yeah. Stanislas. Yeah. So that's uh, so easier to fix. So this is for Stan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is for Stan. Uh, so one of the um, most interesting aspects of your data for me is the fact that you have this dissociation between the regions that respond to the size of the constituent for both normal, normal prose and Jabberwocky and then regions that only respond to constituency size for the normal pros. Um, since that actually begins to sort of get to the question of what are the sort of cognitive computations performed by these regions, so maybe they're, we're starting to see a difference between something like syntactic composition and semantic composition. What I struggle with, though, is the relationship between some of your findings and the rest of the literature that is using some version of the kind of sentence versus word list paradigm both for Jabberwocky and for normal prose. So let me highlight the discrepancies. So, uh, so from the pretty sizable literature so far, we've learned that in roughly Broca's regions, so your you know, IFG uh, uh, regions, there's not an effect of, of, of for any kind of sentence versus word list um, uh, contrast for normal prose or for Jabberwocky. So that's like in Angela Friedrich's original study, for example. Uh, whereas in the temporal pole or in the anterior t an left anterior temporal lobe, there is an effect both for uh, normal prose and for Jabberwocky. So uh, from that kind of generalization, people have then been led to believe that the left anterior temporal lobe really is the syntactic composer and the you know, Broca's region doesn't do anything like that at all. So I'm curious about your thoughts about what's different about your design or results relative to that. Yeah, I can't answer you doing this, actually. Oh, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, well, yes, I, I, first you're absolutely right. I mean, what, so what we've been doing is interpolating, basically, between these conditions of sentence versus word list and, and perhaps better controlling what is feasible with the word list. Um, we, we've been doing these experiments for, I think, I'm afraid, actually, 
20 years, 19 years. So we published in 93 a paper using that with PET, actually, uh, with Bernard Mazoyer. And already the temporal poles were there in the contrast of uh, organized language versus word lists. And uh, the whole system dissolved when we presented Jabberwocky. So I don't think it's an isolated uh, finding, actually. Uh, now, um, the, I don't know, maybe I should go back to Angela Frederici's research. I think there's a lot of convergence towards the same core circuit, and especially the inf in the inferior frontal cortex. Um, what she's been doing is to look more at violations of structure. And, I, and, I, and here that's an important difference in philosophy, I think, that I'm uh, not interested in, well, in this context at least, in what happens to the violations. I think with violations, especially in fMRI, comes a lot of difficulty because the whole system is trying to repair uh, what is happening. And we try to prevent that here by bombarding the system with a list of words so there was no way you could repair it. Uh, otherwise, I, mean, I think we are seeing a system which has been perturbed and which is trying to repair itself and we see a lot more complications. So uh, very much like uh, Laurie Tyler and I think uh, yourself, we're trying to look at the normal structure building in the system. Now, there may still be contradictions, but uh, I, I think that what we are finding is very stable here. We replicate it a number of times. Um, the temporal poles are very interesting. Uh, they, are, they are, first, they are bilateral. They are not, they are left lateralized, but there is a strong activation on the right side as well f during language processing. And it seems to have to do with the highest level of sentential and uh, even uh, uh, prose uh, representation. And uh, from the uh, purely anatomical point of view that Jean-Pierre was uh, pointing out, it may be that the anterior temporal pole is one of these high-level convergence zones already in uh, history as primates before the advent of language, storing representations of events. Um, so you have to represent the scene in context, the people who are contributing to that scene, and then you store it as an event and it goes into your hippocampus. Um, so the hippocampus is the prime storage of uh, episodic memory, of course, episodes. And it looks like we are again using this circuitry again for the highest level of language where a sentence consists really of little episodes of who did what to whom. That would be my speculation. That, that's perhaps why it has to do more with the meaning of what happened than with the actual you know, basic syntactic rules that are being used. Yeah. May I ask a question to Sanisas? Yes. Oh yeah. uh, when uh, you are speaking uh, and listening to you, uh, your sentences are extremely long. And, uh, <laughs> and in fact, um, continuing for quite a few minutes uh, sometimes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am it's just, training, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just <laughs> wondering how, how you view uh, uh, the actual uh, development of all these things as a function of time because uh, uh, it's clear that you cannot stop at uh, 6 or 12 and that uh, if you have a continuous flow of, uh, of uh, items entering into the brain or being produced by your uh, language, you may have to renew the whole thing. Mm. So how do you view the dynamics of what you just uh, presented? It's a great question. I, I just don't know. Uh, you're absolutely right that it has to stop somewhere and in fact <laughs> Sentences. Does not. Oh well, I, I well, you know, I would love to have this discussion with the true linguist in the in the in the room. But I know that the sentence is a particular unit in linguistics. For instance, for pronoun reference, it's very important to distinguish what happens inside the sentence and what happens outside of it. Right? Maybe no. I don't know. So uh, I, I suspect that there is yes another level of discourse that we are not we have not touched at all. No, no, the but it's not a let, let me uh, just... Uh, oh, by the way, we only did the right branching. Uh, uh, and we uh, purposely avoided the question of movement as much as we could. No, no, but let me come back on this because uh, I think it's an interesting issue as far as uh, brain imaging and all these things. Uh, so if you feel that you have chunks of sentences or of sentences which are being produced in a discourse like the one we are uh, producing during our talks, so it means that at after a certain stage there is some kind of... Uh, shutting off of the mechanism that you are, you are showing, mm. or uh, uh, switch back to zero at uh, some stage. So how do you have you some evidence for that? 
well and, so, and that's mm. then you you have you know when you you fill up the thing then you go back to the initial thing and so on and so forth so it means that you have a way for uh, uh, switching back to the initial state at some stage so, uh, well I, I show this little oh model right. that we have in mind where we build up the structure and then it collapses when you reach a word that you can't integrate yes. in the constituent and that's a model, of course, which accounts for some of the fMRI data. We did the very same experiment in MEG and uh, using the same technique yes. that uh, you've been using. And um, we find that if we look at the beta band, uh, uh, power in the beta band, we see a buildup of activation and then a stop in, mm. in uh, some of the sensors. It's hard to know where, where it's coming from in the brain. But so this model of a buildup and a collapse and then you start building up again, has something to it. So it may have yeah. to restart to the beginning of itself. Um, rather, rather long um, comment, I'm afraid, but, but relating to yours. Uh, and if I may, I'll start with birdsong. Um, so th there's been uh, some suggestions in the evolution of language literature that, that there's some continuity between the syntax that you, you can find in birdsong and the syntax that you can find in humans. Um, birdsong uh, has, in the complicated case, has, has phrasal structure, but it's not very deep. Um, and I've argued that you can relate the phrasal structure that you find in, in zebra finch song, for example, to two specific nuclei in, in the zebra finch brain. So, so it seems reasonable to say that there's um, uh, an HVC nucleus which, which codes for uh, the structure of a whole motif or a whole whole phrase, and then send sparse signals out to the uh, to the motor apparatus, which, which produce the individual notes, and it can do this over and over again. But that gives you s just one extra level of, of phrase structure, and what of course humans have is not not a, an infinite number, but many many more levels. Um, now, uh, if if you try to uh, um, apply um, an old-fashioned model of phrase structure where you say we start with a sentence, an S, and that goes to an MP and a VP. I'm being very old-fashioned here. And a VP goes to something else. Then you, you have quite a few layers of different kinds of structure. Um, and it, it seems to me that, uh, that you, you don't have enough layers I in a birdsong kind of model to, to accommodate that kind of structure. Now, within linguistics, uh, it seems to me there's been a, a paradigm shift away from that kind of uh, model of syntactic structure to saying basically that in some sense there are no phrases. Um, you, uh, so this is uh, minimalism. Uh, you, you start with a word, you combine it with another word, and its identity is, is inherited from the, inherited, the, the identity of one of the original words. So go is a verb, go slowly is a verby thing, Go slowly home is a verby thing. Go slowly home um, backwards, whatever, okay, <laughs> is also a verby thing. You haven't got any kind of um, phrase hood in these, um, in these representations. And it strikes me that that's much more compatible with the kind of picture you've been uh, talking about than with any picture that would try to identify bits of old fashioned syntactic structure, like here's where an MP is, is uh, is represented in the brain. Here is where a VP is represented in the brain. That's all. Have I made that clear? Um, I, don't well, I don't know. I mean, it was not a question. I agree with you, <laughs> but uh, first of all, the the plausibility of the birdsong model as an interesting model of, of language. Uh, I think there are very significant homologies. I also showed you this slide of the hierarchical organization of delays in the cortex of even the young baby. So that's a possibility of having temporal structure helping you build higher and higher levels of structure in language. Yeah, uh, higher higher. Uh, so in the case of humans, it's possible that we have more levels, right? We have the phoneme, we have the syllable, we have the word, we have the phrases and so on. I totally agree with you. At some point it becomes the wrong model of language because at some points we have this ability to create merged objects that are perfectly valid objects that can enter into any other structure. So 
we are struggling all with this uh, complexity, but I, I sort of envisage the, the temporal system, which I think David will talk about, that is parsing the inputs at different scales, and then there is this loop to prefrontal cortex, which allows you to create merge objects and recycle them inside the same structure, and that's what we don't understand. Uh, Richie, did you want to respond to some uh, one thing to something that, that y you said a few minutes ago that you were testing only right branching structures. I think you were testing only structures that you thought were right branching, but it's not at all clear that that the example you had up was a simple right branching structure. It depends on which you're well, it depends on, on how syntax works. And, uh, um, and with respect to what Jim Herford just said, I, I didn't recognize syntax in, in, in what he said. The, the idea that you have a verb go that projects up endlessly just doesn't correspond to what people are learning about syntax in the last 20 or whatever year. Uh, the inclusiveness condition, I think that's what Chomsky calls it. Apologies, that's what I said. Is it not? That, uh, no. There's no marker of phrase ho in uh, syntactic representations. Well, what is true is that in bare phrase structure, the, the category of the phrase is projected up it, by the head, but there are many, many, many heads, and the idea that you adjoin indefinitely to a verb is logically possible, but it doesn't seem correct. So, uh, I have a... Well, I, I have a couple of questions, but I think in the interest of time and lunch, I'll only ask one of them, which uh, concerns uh, math, actually. And I'm sure that in coming up with your stimuli, you must have thought long and hard about how to make them analogous, the linguistic and the mathematical stimuli. Um, but I think there's a way in which they're not analogous and in which they cannot be analogous. So this is not a methodological point. Instead, it's sort of a reflection on the two domains which is that, you know, the minute you're looking at a mathematical sort of string and you see a closed paren with no open paren before it, you just sort of say, okay, fine, forget this. You know, it's, it, it is gibberish. So if you have, you know, a local four plus two or, you know, some little bit of local constituent in the string, then yes, formally it's a two constituent string. But I had a very strong reaction that it was only the formally composed mathematical string that counted it all. I mean, after that, it was like, who cares about this? Whereas in the linguistic strings that you made up, the little local sections each made sense. And I was fine with that. Um, I think maybe partly because language sometimes is, as we know, locally coherent. And, you know, if you hang on long enough, you can make it move together. But mathematics doesn't work that way. And if you had put together local four plus twos and six divided by three and stuff, it, it would have made sense. In other words, because we know to be mathematical equations barring everything else, left to right, and the order of operations is what it is. So you couldn't mess it up if you made it locally coherent. And I think that tells us something about the differences between the domains. Um, so this is rambling, but I wonder if you care to comment. Uh, I disagree. I, uh, I think that you could argue that it's just as violating in a, in a French sentence to start with a noun, for instance, without an article. It's just as violating as having a closing parenthesis before an opening one. And we try to minimize the differences. So first, we have evidence that even with the equations, it's not just the structured versus anything else. It's the intermediate levels are being constructed, both behaviorally and neurally. And um, we've done also the converse manipulation. So inside language, we've used situations when there is a little bit of structure inside a mixed up list, right? So this is another way to design it, is you keep a little bit of structure and then there is a list. And that did not make any difference. Um, so I, I do think that the parallels are real between the two stimuli and the differences therefore are also real. Yeah. Uh. I didn't mean that the differences aren't real. What I meant is that 
I thought it was actually um, a reflection on why the brain might be this way, mm -hmm. that the stimuli are inherently different and the brain needs to process differently stimuli that are inherently mm. different. So yeah. I actually meant it to be a virtue, not a criticism, but... Okay, yeah. Uh, the one aspect in which they are really different is the parallel versus sequential nature. And I think it's a wonderful invention of the mathematical notation that we can display in parallel and even in two dimensions. We only used one dimension, but it's really two-dimensional. We can display syntactic structure in a mathematical formula. And it looks like our visual system loves it and can process it in 200 milliseconds, basically. But that, but that, that's exactly the problem in the comparison of your of your two kinds of studies. Because in in the language studies, what you give them as sequential uh, sequences of elements, and the task is to extract the the constituents, the structure, and it's exactly the opposite that you are they are expected to do in the in the mathematical task. You give them the structure, right, and they have to they have to uh, extract the sequence, and that's what they do. That's what the the eye tracking that mm -hmm. they they. they they extract the sequence. So, so you shouldn't actually expect the same results in the two studies, even if there is a common element. There are common elements between the, uh, how the, the structure is represented. Well, I agree there is this difference. I would still have expected some areas to show a shared code if language was extremely important for, for mathematical formulas. Uh, we try to present mathematical formulas one symbol at a time, and that's horrible. It just Even trained mathematicians can't understand it. My name is Honing. I'm uh, interested in, uh, in music cognition. So my question is about the uh, relationships you showed between language and music. And in a way, it's a surprising result. Um, in the sense that there are quite a few theories and also evidence that if music and language share something, mm -hmm. it is highly likely that it is syntax. Mm -hmm. So how would you explain this particular result? Um, and is it maybe because of the manipulation with music you did, which is mm. peculiar in a way. You, you sort of uh, randomize chunks of a famous composer. Mm. You could have combined that to randomize famous chunk of a famous writer, Shakespeare mm. or something. You didn't do that. So um, mm. how would yeah. you contribute this, 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 yeah, actually evidence against the notion that syntactic uh, structures are shared between music and language? No, we, we, well, we did find sharing and especially in the trained subjects, right? So, so we, we did find it. Uh, it's just not as salient as in the language domain, and especially I'm struck by the people who are not trained to be musicians, not showing uh, much uh, activation in the same areas. Um, I think that fits relatively well with the existing literature, but uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert. I agree with you that any such experiment, you know, really need to look at the details, and especially the task which is being done. And that's why I was really telling you, and different experiments have to have different tasks. We couldn't ask about, uh, you know, a meaning for music, so we had to resort to this detection of timber. And so we think it's not an artifact, but you really have to look closely into that. Um, so we are replicating these experiments now with purely rhythmic stimuli and purely melodic stimuli as well. And uh, for the moment, it looks the same, but, you know, it's not final. Um, I had a similar kind of, so two questions back, the mathematical uh, linguistic analogy. I had similar questions in mind, and I was wondering whether you thought maybe of using Polish notation rather than the standard notation, because that would give you two advantages. Mm -hmm. First, you drop all the brackets. So Polish notation is where instead of writing A plus B, you do plus AB. Mm -hmm. So you drop all the brackets, mm -hmm. and you actually do then begin to set up long distance dependencies. Mm -hmm. So if a sign is, you know, when you get multiple mm -hmm. signs together, sometimes you've got to wait until something else comes along before you know what it associates with. So that might give you something more of a, a linguistic analogy to work off. Yeah, uh, totally. You know, we, we're thinking about it. Of course, nobody is really expert in Polish notation. At least it's very difficult to find experts in this domain. So this would be looking at, indeed, the nested structure for which we require an effort and a sequential uh, analysis. I think it would be very interesting. So we're already thinking of it with Mariano Sigmund, who is doing these experiments. Yes, I'm uh, Ana Maria Di Schulo, and I want to ask you a question about language and mathematics. Did you look at multiplication structures uh, in equations, and whether you think that uh, there might be a difference between multiplication and addition? In fact, when you have names of numbers, well, you have additive structure and multiplicative structure, right? And 
perhaps there are difference in the complexity of these structures. So perhaps it would be interesting to consider also experimental test to see whether first number name activate some area which are closer to Broca's or not. And then if there is a difference in when you have multiplicative structure versus, uh, versus additive structure. Uh, this is a great question. There, there, there are lots of things that could be said. For instance, we know that multiplication tables tends to be, tend to be memorized in language, but you really mean the syntax of multiplication. And uh, we, uh, well, Mariano Sigmund did the behavioral experiments with multiplication as well. It's no different. In fact, in this case, what's nice is there are no parentheses at all. It's only the precedence of operations defining the structure. And it still works in exactly the same way in behavior. Subjects eyes know the, the depths extremely quickly. Uh, we've also analyzed separately the addition and subtraction structures that do or do not require parentheses, and there was absolutely no difference. Thank you. We, we're doing exactly that at the moment, yeah. Uh, lists like 712 versus 1207 or something like that. So um, one thing that I think is different about uh, language than about music or uh, ma uh, mathematics of the sort that you've been uh, studying is that we can't help ourselves but to process language mm. structure. And I think even when you're given Jabberwocky or when you're given just fragments of sentences, you really can't help yourself but to put them together. Uh, in contrast, I think in the case mm. of mathematics, it's quite easy to do what Nora was saying and look at a problem and go, blah, uh, mm. I'm just not going to deal with that. And in the case of music, I'm not so sure. On the one hand, of course, we hear the coherence in the Mozart piece and, and not uh, in the others. But if you gave us a real structural task, like detecting variations on a theme, detecting the recurrence of a theme, and is it in the same key or a different key, then you might well find that, that musical processing is much more optional mm. uh, and dependent on expertise and all of that than mm. language processing is. Which leads me to the following question. In all of your studies, you're either using incidental viewing, listening, mm. or you're giving a task that's irrelevant to the structure itself, like mm. detecting the change in timbre, mm. change in voice. Mm. And in the case of language, that's fine, because you're processing the structure whether mm. you're being asked to or not. But if it's, that's not true in the other cases, I wonder if it could still be the case that there could be a single underlying recursion faculty or uh, process mm. that appears in all of these domains when you're in a situation that you're, where you're engaging in the appropriate processing and you just need different tasks in order to elicit that uh, in domains well, other that's than That's a language. wonderful suggestion. I think it's very plausible, actually. Uh, so for instance, in the, in the equations case, the behavioral work was done when subjects were doing the computation. But for the imaging, we wanted to avoid that because, of course, then there would have been a higher number of computations. So this would have been a conform. So we avoided it, exactly as you said, by having an incidental task of matching two strings, which could be done whether they were destructured or not. But uh, if we had asked them to do the calculation, we would have seen a lot of activation. And I suspect, like you, but we have to do the experiment, but I suspect it would include some of these language areas. Yeah. So it's very task dependent, but then there are strong issues of design of these experiments that I don't really know how to solve. 